so it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Peter Scholz, who will uh, uh, talk about the, the joint work with uh, Dustin Clausen on new foundations of real functional analysis. And the title of his talk is uh, Liquid R Vector Spaces. So Peter, that's yours. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak here. Uh, so it's a yeah, great pleasure to speak about my joint work with Dustin Clausen. Um, <clears throat> So in particular, I want to speak here about the stuff about what we did over the real numbers. Um, so the basic question, um, like we, we somewhat proposed these kind of new foundations for doing topology to work with condensed sets instead. And as Dustin explained, uh, one key point in, is that condensed sets, they are also really nice from an algebraic point of view. They basically like an algebraic theory in the sense of the word. Um, <laughs> And I mean, also back to, going back to low variance, there was a suggestion to use topos to uh, study functional analysis. So you define this phonological topos, I think, and uh, propose this as a possible new way to do functional analysis. And we have a slightly different um, topos called the condensed totals. And we really claim that in this condensed topos, you can really do it. Um, so the, the question someone is, can one uh, use the condensed topos? Sorry, uh, who, who suggested the biological topos? Maybe it was Johnstone? Johnstone? Actually, I'm confused. That one was Levere, and Johnson had this topological topos. Uh, sorry. I think Johnson wrote a paper on a topological topos. Uh huh. So, anyway, so the, yeah, there, there have been previous uh, proposals for stuff like that. Um, um, sorry. Uh, condensed topos to some of Sometimes algebra is a function. <clears throat> um, so, so what do you want roughly? Uh, we want a nice category uh, that we call liquid object spaces. So these should uh, be a full subcategory of the condensed ones. And so the, what you should have someone in mind as the analogy is that some of all condensed object spaces it's roughly analogous to some of all topological object spaces. <clears throat> but <clears throat> if you work with all of them, then I mean, you can't really control those. In particular, like if you try to form a tensor product, then I mean, you do want to take some kind of completed tensor products when you, when you work with topological vector space. You don't just want some kind of abstract algebraic tensor product. <clears throat> and so one uh, standard category that's usually isolated on uh, when one works topological vector spaces is this class of complete locally convex uh, vector spaces. That's like the standard class, of, a big class of topological vector spaces where all the examples like Banner, Frechet, and whatnot spaces live. <clears throat> but that's also a class that one can reasonably control. And so roughly these liquid R vector spaces, they should be something like the complete locally convex. Uh, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's the whole. But <clears throat> so in particular, well, there should be some kind of completion functor here. And that you know, should be well behaved in some ways. And then it was, we also want a nice center product. Yeah? Center product. Um, that is, let me just say that this is computable in practice. <clears throat> um, so actually, this is tying to the early work of Grotendieck uh, to his late work in some sense. I mean, his early work was exactly about functionalism, exactly about this problem of defining tensor products of Banach spaces and things like this. So you define this projective tensor product, the injective tensor product, uh, many intermediate ones, and proved many interesting results about those. Um, <clears throat> right, yeah. uh, so what are some of the, uh, some of the desiderata um, that we would like to have? We well, we definitely we want to keep the good categorical properties. Uh, condensed object spaces are like generally, I mean, all this condensed stuff has very good categorical properties, and we wanted these classes, this class of 
companies want to sleep at once. So in particular, <coughs> we want that it's still in the BN category so that one can do homological algebra in the setting without any trouble. <coughs> Um, we want that it's still uh, generated by compact projectives. And <clears throat> um, maybe this is, I mean, actually, the existence of compact projectives would actually be formal once you have this kind of left to join completion function here, because if this is a compact projective generator. So. The completion will automatically give you these compact projective generators. So if you want this kind of picture, this will be automatic. There's a B and it's not, not quite automatic. <clears throat> and maybe it's not so clear that one should hope for all of these properties, but it will be true. Um, so maybe it's not a, something you desire a priori, but it turns out that you can get it and then it's very nice to have it. So this category should also be stable under all limits, uh, co-limits. And extensions. <clears throat> okay. Um, but before I want to uh, get into this over the real numbers, I want to briefly recall a similar thing that you can do in non Archimedean functional analysis over the periodic numbers. So, interlude. The analog over the periodic numbers. So P is some fixed prime number now. Uh, QP. <clears throat> so you can just as well consider condensed uh, QP vector spaces. <clears throat> and then, uh, <clears throat> then we define this notion of the so called solid QP vector spaces. Inside of all uh, condensed QP vector spaces. <clears throat> and uh, let me briefly recall how, how solid is defined. So, um, so there's some kind of completion that we call solidification, of course. <clears throat> and so, okay, so here, uh, the comp let's first under try to understand what the compact projectives are. So as, I, as Dustin uh, explained, these categories that we consider, they are very often they are generated by compact projective objects, and really those are the ones you have to understand first. And here, it's a very general, the compact projectives for any condensed ring, they would, the modules would be just the QP of join S, where S is one of these extremely disconnected. Uh, profinite sets. So one of these compact projective condensed sets. <clears throat> um, these are, the problem is that these, these things are rather inexplicit. There are some of the, the elements there are just formal, formal sums, formal finite sums uh, of uh, points in S with QP coefficients, and then you give it some kind of funny condensed structure. Um, <clears throat> what uh, the three guys here, um, well, the free solid QP vector space on S. <clears throat> well, uh, let me just say what it is. It's exactly the space of measures on S with QP coefficients. So one way to define this would be to take the internal home from the continuous functions from S into QP into QP. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so what is a measure really? And, and like, it's, it's something that to any continuous function associates a number. So yeah, that's what a measure should be. A uh, slightly different way to write it is that it's also <clears throat> you can also, if you write, if you write S as an inverse limit of finite sets as I's, it's a finite, so it's a profinite set, right? So you can write this as projective limit of finite sets. Then 
Uh, well, <clears throat> a dense subspace of the continuous functions is really given by the by the characteristic functions of open and closed subsets, or the, fine, the, the QP linear span of these. So it's enough to somehow say, <clears throat> to define a measure, it's enough to say what the measure of each uh, open and closed subset is, and each open and closed subset somehow comes by a pullback from one of these finite quotients. Um, so there should be a way to describe the measures somewhere here in terms of this description. And, <clears throat> and what you get in this way is that you take the free guy on SI, takes the inverse limit of all of those. So this is then some compact to be in group. And then you uh, just invert P at the end. <clears throat> and so in general, the condensed QP vector space V is solid <clears throat> if, I mean, that can be taken as a definition, but only if for all such profiles at S and all maps from F from S into V. Well, what should it mean to be solid? Well, it means that so whenever you map S and use a free guy on S maps in, right? That's what it means that it's a free solid QP vector space on S. So um, this here maps to the, to the space of measures on S with QP coefficients, and there should be a unique extension. Where <clears throat> this map here, how does S map into the space of measures? That's just by the Dirac measures. <clears throat> so coming back somewhat to the general picture here, like, if you don't force any completeness, if you look at all condensed QP vector spaces, then you can also think of QP as drawn S or some space of measures, but it's just the space of measures. It's just a finite, it's a finite atomic measure, right? Uh, just a finite sum of Dirac measures. But if you want to encode some kind of completeness, then you should ask that certain infinite sums are also convergent. So when you when you some certain measures supported on infinite set, or even like some kind of hard measures thing that supported. Uh, on the whole profile set in some sense. Uh, then you should be able to integrate a lot against any such measure and still get something. So, uh, I mean, this is totally here. Oops. So you get some ex extension here. And the way to think of this extension is that um, if you evaluate this F tilde on some measure mu, the mu sub element of the space of measures. <clears throat> This is the integral of F against this measure mu. Okay. So this already looks a little bit like function analysis. So <clears throat> yeah, uh, so that's how we can define these uh, solid QP vector spaces. So you ask that whenever you map some profile seven or just an extremely disconnected one, it doesn't matter in the end. Um, <clears throat> You can even really map the whole space of measures uh, on, on the space. <clears throat> okay. And so um, from this characterization, I mean, you can actually, if you start with a Banach space or a Fresnel space, then <clears throat> it's quite easy to see that um, these kind of, uh, these kind of um, integrations here against measures can be defined. And so um, the corresponding condensed QP vector space for such Banach or Fichet spaces, they are solid. So Banach, Q, Banach over QP or QP Banach. Well, it's containing QP of Fichet. And, <clears throat> these are containing solid QP vector spaces. And the really nice thing is, I mean, you, you do get some kind of ten, solid, uh, solid tensor product here. And the really nice thing is that uh, this, these inclusions, they are compatible with tensor products. <clears throat> okay, so you, you can define tensor product here. I mean, it just comes in such a way that somehow the completion is compatible with the tensor product. So one way to compute is somehow to take the tensor product, like condensed QP vector spaces, and then re-solidify. And it turns out, and that's a quite non-trivial computation actually, that if you do that to QP fresh spaces, then the tensor product is still a QP fresh space and is, is a usual tensor product of QP fresh spaces. 
And so this way you can really embed periodic functional analysis into the setting of solid QP vector spaces. And you, what you gain here is really that uh, and this is an abelian category and you have a really nice ambient derived category. And if you want to do all sorts of homological algebra, it's really convenient in this category. Um, it has been used now in some papers on Katie Cox theory, this, this formalism. Uh, by Guido Bosco in particular. <clears throat> okay, so, so what we would like to achieve is, uh, is the analogous picture uh, over the real numbers. Yeah? The goal is um, achieve the analogous thing. Over R. <clears throat> um, but there is some kind of very important technical problem uh, I was trying to do this. So recall that uh, that the whole condensed formalism is very much based on profinite sets. A condensed sets are glued from profinite sets. And in, but and QP is of course locally profinite. I mean, ZP in particular is profinite; it's a counter set. And so, to to these these speak to each other, but the real numbers they are not at all. I mean, they are connected; they are continuum; they are not at all profinite. Um, but the condensed formalism somehow always asks you to somehow chop up your real number chop up everything into some profinite sets. See? So you need to chop up your real numbers, cut them again and again and again into small and smaller counter sets um, <clears throat> and reassemble someone in the end. And uh, this seems like a very strange thing to do for the real numbers. And it's not at all clear that you can really control this. So the problem, but, but R is decidedly not. So. <clears throat> I mean, some of the real technical problem ones run into is to how to resolve nice R vector spaces by the free condensed R vector spaces on profinite sets. <clears throat> so if you want to compute some X group, you do have, have to use these projective resolutions in say condensed R modules. And so the projective objects they are, these are joined S where S with some extremely disconnected set. And so if you want to compute some X group, you have to resolve by these guys. And absolutely, you know, you can do it. You can always find these objections from these extremely disconnected sets. But the, the way you do this is completely inexplicit. I mean, it uses these stone chess compactifications of the, some of discretized vector spaces. So you can a priori never hope to, to, to get an explicit control on this. And so, <clears throat> Someone not so clear how you can really um, achieve that. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the problem you will run into, but let's first just try to naively uh, redo uh, over the real numbers what we did over the periodic numbers. So here's the first naive try. So first try, maybe not completely naive. Um, first try uh, for a series of liquid vector spaces. Uh, by the way, this, the, the reason this is called liquid and not, not solid with real numbers is that um, there is this kind of very general notion of a solid being group, those so defined with the integers, um, and which over QP is somewhat specialized for solid QP vector spaces. But <clears throat> the real numbers are not solid. And if you have a condensed real vector space that is solid, it must be zero. So this notion of solidness is somewhat way too strong. Uh, to work over the real numbers. And so we need to do something else over the real numbers. And something, something. so if you think of all condensed things as some of these clouds and profile sets as something gaseous, then the solid things are like the most cooled down things, the most rigid things. And these liquid R vector spaces we will define, they're somewhat intermediate. Uh, they're <clears throat> not as, not as, I don't know, like a gaze, they're more, like more condensed, like a liquid, but. And sometimes they will even depend on an exterior parameter that one might think of the temperature. 
but uh, you can't make them completely solid. Um, anyways, that's just uh, about, about the names. Okay, so what's the first try for a series of um, liquid object spaces? So we want to define the free complete guy. Finite set S or an extremely disconnected one. <clears throat> Turns out that usually in practice, you can always define everything for profile sets already, not just for the extremely disconnected ones, even if they do play an important technical role. Um, and then we already can write this as an extremely disconnected. Um, yes, but what one should do is to take the space of measures. So uh, what is this? So one way to think about this is that it's again just the internal home from the continuous functions from S into R. So this is the Banach space with the soot norm, the particular topological object space, and so you can regard it as a condensed object space. You could also simply define this as the internal home you know, from S into R. That's it. Okay. This also has immediately a condensed structure, which is the one you would think about. And then you can map this back to R. And takes the internal home well over R. Um, and so this is some condensed on vector space. And it's this uh, space. And there are several different names, I think, for this. So sometimes they're called signed right on measures. <clears throat> it's just the usual space of measures that's considered in functional analysis. So on any compact host of space, even you can define the space of measures. And then maybe there is some discussion about which topology you put to put on this. And well, there's one natural topology which would agree with this condensed structure. So basically it's a weak topology. It's, it's compactly generated version to be very precise. <clears throat> and so actually there's a way to write this uh, that's very analogous. Um, so how we've written the space of measures of the periodic numbers here. Um, <clears throat> namely, what you can do is you can, first of all, I mean, for each of these finite sets SI, you can take the free vector space on SI. And I mean, for a finite set, okay, so it's like the space of measures on a finite set, this R join SI, of course, generated by the Dirac measures, but, <clears throat> Um, you shouldn't take the whole inverse limit because uh, this would be way too big. We want some kind of boundedness. And one way to say this is that we always take the part where the L1 norm is bounded by something. That's, if you want to say that it's a, um, it's a bounded measure, then you should ask that like, the value on any subset is bounded. And this precisely means that you bound the L1 norm. Uh, L1 norm yeah. in this vector space is you say the L1 norm is less or equal to some constant. And then in the end, you take the union here of all, all constants that are bigger than zero. <clears throat> so again, this space here, and this here is some uh, bounded closed subset of some finite dimensional real vector space. So that's a compact cost of space. And then by the theorem of Trifonov, the inverse limit is still a compact cost of space. So this is again, some kind of compact cost of. Now, of course, this time it's not profinite. It was profinite over the periodic numbers. <clears throat> and then in the end, just, just scale it out. So it's the analog of inverting P in the other description. <clears throat> so over, um, this is analogous to what we've done here, except that here, we didn't take the L1 norm, but we chose the L infinity norm. And that's just because uh, over, over the periodic numbers, we have the ultra-metric inequality. So if you say that the measure is bounded, then it's enough to know it's bounded by one. It's enough to know it's bounded by one in all the atoms because the sums don't make anything larger. Um, so here we somehow did the analogous thing by but using the L infinity norm, sub norm, and then take an inverse limit and then the inverting P is a sigma continuous union. <clears throat> but if you want to have really an inverse system here, I mean, it's really necessary to take the L1 norm here. Otherwise, there wouldn't even be anything you can write down. Okay. 
Um, right. So, uh, so that's that's what we would try to do. And then there is a basic uh, proposition that if V is a complete locally convex topological vector space. And you have some map from S into V. Okay, this is pro finite. And then there exists a unique F tilde from the space of measures to say the corresponding condensed vector space extending. <clears throat> right? Um, and so this looks encouraging that um, like taking these things here as your basic build compact projective building blocks um, might give you uh, a good theory. Um, so in particular, you know, all the banner for J space there, it's only very well satisfied for this property. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good thing. Uh, but then you run into a problem. And the problem is that uh, uh, um, the x1 of such a space of measures uh, against R can be non zero. So, for example, <clears throat> um, S being the one point compactification of the integers. Okay, and so that's a problem because so if there exists such an extension, here you have the space of measures. Here you have some some extension V, and here you have the wheels. And I mean here you have S mapping in L by the Dirac measures. And actually, this lifts because uh, the obstruction to lifting is given by some h1 of s with real coefficients, and this turns out to vanish. <clears throat> but then, if there was this nice category uh, um, that's stable under extensions, then uh, this f should extend. To a splitting. Uh, but that this X group is non zero in general. So it follows that if you want your category to be stable under extensions, then this cannot work. And if you think more about it, you can also show that it, it's whatever you want to write down, it can't be, can't be in a BN category. It's slightly easier to somehow show that it can't be stable under extensions, but it also is true that it's not. Um, and the origin of these extensions as uh, um, I mean, this is paper from Riva from the 1970s, from the 1960s. Um, he gave an example of such an extension. Uh, of Maybe not exactly for the space of measures here, but for the close related space of L1 functions on S, um, they are very, very close. And this extension is also defined in our space, anyways. Um, so such extensions uh, can be constructed from the entropy functional, the Shannon entropy. The H of some sequence of numbers xi is the sum of the xi times log xi. <clears throat> and the key point about entropy is that it's locally linear, locally almost linear. So the Shannon entropy of some xi plus the Shannon entropy of some yi minus the Shannon entropy of some xi plus yi. Um, is bounded by 
a constant times. Well, let's let's say the sum of the xi's here is normalized to be one, and they are greater or equal to zero. And this is equal to a constant. And maybe to to make sense of this, I should divide this by two here. <clears throat> or generally, if you sum a scale. A times one plus one one minus a times the other, then it's bounded by a constant, uh, but not globally almost linear. <clears throat> and uh, it turns out that somehow what this x one group here measures is in some sense locally almost linear things because if you want to do some kind of extension of vector spaces, it's you, know, you can write down. Kind of locally first, and then you need to write on a cold cycle that's somehow almost linear to define this, and then global, but to define a splitting, you would need to somehow global almost linear. Uh, you need to be globally almost linear. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so that put us down for quite a while. So so what this shows is that this V is not locally convex. This extension V is not locally convex. So it turns out that this notion of local complexity is just not a notion over the real number that's stable under extensions. There's basically no way to force it to be so. So we, it, it is just strictly necessary to uh, allow non-local complex space into the picture. <laughs> okay, and so then, <clears throat> then we learned about the space, uh, the square of Cartong, etc. Uh, Cartong and others. So there's this notion of p convexity, and now suddenly p is not a prime anymore. Sorry, um, where p can be any number between zero and one. Um, so P Banach is like a Banach, uh, some complete norm vector space. But uh, the scaling behavior is different. So the norm of A times V is uh, the norm of A to the P times the norm of V, where P is in V, A is not. I mean, I guess I decided different ways of uh, defining, of saying what's the norm is. So I want that the norm still satisfies the usual triangle inequality, but the scaling behavior is different. And so some example of this is, um, <clears throat> um, you take, take the kind of the LP space on the, on the, the integers. So this is a set of all xi, i and n. Such that sum of the xi to the p is finite. And uh, this thing here would, would then be the norm. And I mean, sometimes one again that takes a piece root of it to get the usual scaling behavior, but some other triangle inequality, but it's, it's equivalent somehow. And I find this expression slightly nicer to work with, and again, taking the piece root of it in the end. Um, <clears throat> right. So, so maybe I should draw a picture. So, if, uh, in dimension two. So, if you if you have a standard basis element, then <clears throat> well, let's start with L infinity. So that's here L infinity, this cube. Um, this here is L2. Uh, this here is L1. So you probably can't look at this. Uh, and then, then it becomes non convex. Okay. So then you have some L a half. And then, I don't know. 
become sinner and sinner. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, and so, yeah, we really need to look at these non convex figures here. So, and uh, so there's a theorem of Calton. Uh, that an extension of p banners is at least p prime banner uh, for p prime less than p. So I should say maybe say that p banner, if you have a p banner, if you have something that's p convex for some p, then it's also p prime banner uh, for all p prime that are at most p. Um. <coughs> And I guess uh, for this, I need to rescale my norm, but it will still satisfy the right term. Um, and so, yeah, you, you might lose a little bit of this complexity when you take extensions, but just infinitesimally, uh, still p prime banner for all p prime less than p. So in particular, if you don't ask that it's like one convex, but only that it's less than one convex, so p convex for all p less than one, then this is somehow a condition that has a chance of being stable under extensions. And maybe also higher extensions and so on. Um, and this is actually what we go for. So, so here's the definition. And everything from now on will depend on a auxiliary parameter p that lies between zero and one. And the fact that the theory of liquid R vector space somehow depends on an exterior parameter is, I think, the profound mystery of nature that um, we don't understand yet. Okay. <clears throat> so fix uh, such a parameter, um, then free uh, P liquid R vector space on some profile set S. is uh, well, the space of less than p measures on this. So that's defined as a union of all p prime less than p of so p prime measures on this, where these p prime measures on this are defined just in the same way as the measures, just replacing the L1 norm by the L p prime norm. You take the free guy on these SIs, and then you take the part where the L prime L prime norm is at most. <clears throat> and then we can define what a condensed when a condensed R vector space is liquid or P liquid. Uh, if for all S and S uh, functions into B, well, again, there's this map here into the Dirac measures in the space of all measures, if you want to take this unique extension. <coughs> okay. And Yeah, so then the theorem is that uh, this defines an analytic ring structure. On R. In particular, so we didn't say what these analytic rings are, but in particular, uh, P liquid R vector spaces are in a being category generated by these contact projectives. I mean, this P where S is extremely disconnected. They are stable under all limits, co-limits, and extensions.
they have a nice symmetric normal tensor product. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> So there's a slew of structure. I mean, this, you can also have a nice derived category. There's a whole slew of structure that you get automatically once you have such a non different structure. Um, <clears throat> um, right. So, uh, yeah. And um, again, so some of the banner spaces, they're containing the first phase spaces. They're contained in the, in the P liquid ones for any P. And now, I, <clears throat> the one slightly annoying thing is that the tensor product here will not, in general, restrict to the tensor product you have here. But actually, you can't really expect that, anyways, because Groton Dick defines not one, but several tensor products here. So, you, and sometimes you wouldn't even know which one you should, should get. And maybe that would be a natural guess for which one you should get, but anyways. But what um, about the nuclear case, the case when- the... Yeah, that's what I was just about to say. So in, inside here, you have the nuclear crochet, um, which are the ones that actually most often come up, say when you consider smooth functions on a manifold or holomorphic functions and so on, they're always nuclear. And on them, you get some correct tensor product. Um, So that's again a quite non trivial computation, but it works out in the end. <clears throat> and so, yeah, so you get this beautiful ambient category, a very nice ambient category generated by compact projectors with a tensor product and so on. And in practice, you can compute the tensor products because most often you are dealing with some kind of nuclear free space. <clears throat> so, in a, uh, in Dustin's Justin is currently giving a course about uh, the Ramp homology. And so, in particular, he explains this uh, term of Grotendieck that if you have an algebraic variety with the complex numbers, then this Ramp homology agrees, this algebraic Ramp homology agrees with the analytic Ramp homology. And I mean, the key thing you have to prove there is somehow about when you have a bound, boundary with normal crossings, you have to prove some kind of funny version of a Poincare lemma that some kind of analytic and algebraic version have the same homology. But using this uh, liquid formalism, this immediately reduces to the one variable case because in general, it's just a tensor product of several, the thing in several variables. And so with, with no work, you can reduce to the one variable case where it's just a, a really, really simple computation. So um, I don't know. So I think having such formalism can really be quite helpful. <clears throat> right. Um, So this is theorem, and we conjectured the theorem maybe, I don't know, I think in January 2019. And then we basically spent all of 2019 trying to prove it. Um, and this was really uh, quite a nightmare. So, so the proof is pretty hard. Um, but there's one assertion that we reduced the two rather early on. So the key assertion is the following. Key, key lemma. It's the following. So um, let's say D is a P banner. And P prime is less than P. Then you need to know that the X groups of this uh, space of P prime measures, unless against V is zero for IP. <clears throat> so this is precisely saying that this phenomenon that we could have this, um, where do I have it? All right. I mean, the problem here was that we could have these extensions of these space of measures against the real numbers here. And well, you don't, you don't want extensions against the real numbers, but more generally, you don't want any extensions against p banners. And <clears throat> yeah, so if you would have non-trivial x ones, for example, then again, uh, you would run into trouble, trouble uh, for the same reason as here. So you definitely wanted all such extensions against the p banner uh, base. Yes. Uh, but actually, to really get this whole nice category of analytic ring, uh, 
um, of this analytic ring structure, you don't need, just need the vanishing of the x1, but you need all the higher x to manage. <clears throat> um, but the problem uh, with proving this is that <clears throat> if you want to do this, I mean, you have to compute some x group here. And so how do you compute x groups in condensed R vector spaces? I mean, I guess like this. Um, well, you have to resolve by the free condensed R vector spaces on compact, compact projective sets. So you have to... <clears throat> but this forces you to uh, resolve our vector spaces by proof on and sets. And it's just not really possible. Um, and so for this reason, and also because we are both number series and we always wanted to have some series that's defined not just over the real numbers, but somewhere arithmetically, um, uh, we decided that we will instead try to prove something more general. So we opt for generalization. Um, Namely, you can define a certain ring of um, let's fix some radius between zero and one. Then you can define a certain ring of arithmetic to a long series. The long series TR is a set of all those long series, some a n times t to the n, such that the sum of Tips of way of an times r to the n is finite. <clears throat> so if you want, you can uh, regard this here as the union of all c of some part where this is equal to c. And so this is naturally a profinite set. <clears throat> because what happens here, I mean, when you when you put such a bound here and follow that each individual coefficient a n can take on at most finitely many values, because otherwise this contribution alone would be too big. Um, and it must actually be zero for large enough n. And so then you just get a product of finite sets or a closed subset of the product of finite sets um, for this thing here. So it's a proof finite set. And, and we have a surjection from if uh, zero is less than R prime is less than R, then this space of C series just surjects onto the reals by evaluating at R prime. And actually this presents the real numbers as a quotient of this arithmetic ring. By some by some one element uh, corresponding to the set prime. <clears throat> and so, what we do is actually we um, so we can also define space of measures uh, over this funny arithmetic ring. Again, by taking the union of all c greater than zero of an inverse limit of all i of the free guy on si, where again you, you've just passed to some less or equal to c subspace that's defined in the same way. And actually, finally, I mean, in this sense, in case it's actually some kind of L1 norm that you really take here. <clears throat> and then there is a funny proposition that. This one can very canonical space of measures that you can define integrally, and that some that didn't have a parameter here on some kind of LP norm parameter. It's just using the L1 norm on the integers. 
that if you take that and then mod out by, by this, F, by this uh, one element here to get something with the real numbers, then this is canonically the same thing as the space of P measures on the reals, where P is taken so that R is R prime to the P. <clears throat> and so, this thing I interpolates all spaces of P measures. So if you somehow vary, vary um, the R prime in this interval here, so you have lots of different real points of, of this thing, which is basically some kind of curve. It's basically a principal ideal that means this thing. It has lots of different points. Um, and at these different points, you get these different spaces of P measures on the real line. So there's really some kind of real varying family of uh, copies of the real numbers with uh, these different spaces of measures. And um, so when you when you let p go to zero in some sense, the space of p measures, then in some sense you enter the arithmetic region of this ring. So it really seems inextricably linked. Um, the arithmetic is really inextricably linked to what happens with the real numbers in this picture. And <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> so what really happens here is that. So if you take R prime to be a tenth, then we're somehow really in thinking of real numbers here in terms of uh, decimal expansions, right? So you can write any real number as some a n times uh, one over 10 to the n if you just take the decimal expansion. But decimal expansions per se, they are somehow naturally form a cofinite set because they are built from finite sets zero to nine. Um, and so in this way, we write the real numbers here uh, using something like decimal expansion in terms of something locally cofinite. And so now if we try to, by generalizing our results that we want to prove of the real numbers to this arithmetic wrong series ring, we overcome the problem that the real numbers are not locally profiled because this ring here is locally profiled. Each of these subsets is profiled. So, so we can state analog uh, over the real numbers. Oh, sorry, over Kegel wrong series T R. And uh, this is locally profiled. Or it's a union of profiles. So, I mean, they they can hope to, to find such a projective resolution that you can still understand. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's the first step. And I think it's a rather weird step still because we're trying to really just set up foundations for real functional analysis. And the way we do it is by doing arithmetic. We really work with, you know, with the integers. And um, another key thing happens. Um, we regain some discretized Convexity. <clears throat> so, so recall that we had to prove this statement about uh, um, uh, these uh, p banner spaces. So they are not locally convex. So both of these sides are some non non convex vector space, and this just means that many of the techniques that you would somehow like to do, they don't really work. Um, but after you go to this arithmetic Laurent series ring, then here you're really taking the L1 norm. So this is really behaving like something convex, except that it's somewhat discretized. So you can't always take the midpoint between something, but if there's some, 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 some lattice point that's close to the midpoint, then it will still be somewhat the right norm. So um, yeah, so we, we also regain some convexity in doing this discretization. And Okay, so yeah, we were able to push it through. Uh, 
I mean, so we use the screen in linear resolution. And again, that's slightly weird because we want to do an explicit calculation, but the green link resolution is not explicit. So it seems like a mismatch, but somehow it has enough nice structural properties that you can somehow even do it, although it's not explicit. Um, and actually, one key structure that we use is the homotopy between, well, what does get used in this argument is that multiplying by two internally and externally on the green link resolution is somewhat the same. Here we use some, need to use something slightly stronger than that, namely that addition internally and addition externally are homotopic on the green resolution. <clears throat> uh, so that's um, that's the kind of the kind of structure you have, and then, um, yeah, at some point you somehow need to use that here. This p prime is less than the p that you have here, so that you somehow the norms on the two sides somehow have different scaling behavior. That's some of the key thing. That here, some of the yeah, if you multiply by a real number, then it has a different effect on this side than it has on this side. And this, how in the end you are able to prove the result you want, but. Uh, yeah, I found the argument quite nasty. And uh, so I, I made this challenge to the computer formalization community to, to verify it on a computer. And it turns out that they were able to do it. And just a few weeks ago, they uh, have a completely, have completely formalized the, the, key, the key technical theorem that I was unsure about. So yeah, so it seems to work. Thank, thanks a lot, Peter. 